Welcome to Bioreactor Engineering. I'm Marlouz Peters and I've been at Newcastle University for about a year. And my research interest is in developing sensors for bioprocessing. So you can see how this is aligned to this particular unit. Now, in this first mini lecture, there are two key things you will need to remember. The first thing is about how diverse bioreactors are. So how would the design of a typical stir tank bioreactor look like and how that might differ from a normal reactor? And the second is some of the key design challenges that are associated with bioreactors. And we'll go into more details in the lectures coming afterwards. In this slide, you can see how diverse bioreactors are. Now, the one you've got in the, in, in the bottom, in the middle, is your typical fermenter. So that's something that you probably are all aware of. In principle, we are bioreactors as well because we produce proteins. We produce uh, antibodies, as you can see at the top which uh, actually protect us from foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. Then you can also see in, an, on the top left corner, you can see Dolly, the first cloned sheep. So even animals can be examples of, of bioreactors. And nowadays people are also looking at growing of organs. And the one you can see in the bottom uh, right hand corner, that's actually quite an interesting one. So this is a type of virus. Uh, and this virus is called a phage. So you can see um, that it has, it looks a little bit like a mosquito. So it latches onto a cell and then in, in this big ball that it's got in the top, it will inject a RNA or DNA into the cell. Now, what these phages can do, so this is a phage, uh, they can also produce proteins. And a few years ago, uh, researchers from Cambridge were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for this. So we can also use these viruses or even bacteria as biopsy. Now here you can see that bioreactors are wildly, wildly different. So on the right hand side of the graph, you can see you can look at things like biodiesel or bioethanol, which are producing tons and tons and tons per year or sugars. Whereas on the other hand of the scale, you can look at something which is precision medicine. So precision medicine can be as specific as making a medicine or a specific type of pharmaceutical just for one person. So there we're looking at milligrams. So obviously at what end of the scale you are will depend on how you will design your reactor. Now, looking at this uh, a typical uh, bioreactor, so how is the bioreactor different from your normal reactor? Now, first of all, we say is that our raw materials, and normally you know that these are converted by the help of a catalyst. So here we're saying that these are biologically converted. So it means that in your reactor, you would have something which could be enzymes, it could be microorganisms like bacteria, it could be plant cells, etc., etc. Now, the difference if you have, if your catalyst is, so to speak, alive, is that you really need to maintain these optimal conditions very well. So the control of the reactor becomes much and much more important. So we really need to be very strict when it comes to the pH, when it comes to the temperature, the nutrients, like the sugars, the vitamins that it needs. Because the key differences here is that obviously these uh, microorganisms, they can die. So if you don't control the conditions well, they easily die off. And the difference with a normal reactor is you can have like a bad batch for a while, but obviously you change the conditions and it starts working again. So what the difference is here that obviously your microorganisms are killed off and you can't produce the next batch. So you have a much narrow window in which you can operate and you need to really, really uh, take care of this. Now here you can see the typical design of a stir tank bioreactor. There's a, a couple of things that are very typical when it comes to bioreactors. And the first thing you will see is that it will never, never be fully uh, full. So we're looking usually at a range of around 60%. And you have to imagine part of it is because you have a lot of gases coming in, so you're producing a lot of additional pressure. Foaming is a particular problem. So you see you need that kind of additional headspace um, to make sure that the gas can kind of escape through there. But like if you're working with uh, aerobic uh, culture, is that you always have a sparge on the, on the bottom. So the sparger is the one that actually brings in the bubbles into the reactor. And then to make sure that these is adequately distributed, you would have an impeller. Or you could have like a multi-stage set of impellers to make sure that you stir your tank properly. And then the key thing here is you want to control all of these things. So the normal typical stances you would have is to check the speed of the impeller, the temperature, P 
pH you might often see in some other reactors as well. And the difference in a bioreactor is we're looking at the pH, you're obviously looking at like a very narrow window you're looking at. And then the other key sensors that you're not used to seeing in a normal reactor is the dissolved oxygen, that's the DO, and the carbon dioxide. So the dissolved oxygen, obviously you need to make sure that's sufficient for your organisms to survive. And the, dissolved, uh, the carbon dioxide is there, first of all, it influences the pH, so that's another thing you might check. And it will also will tell you whether um, your microorganisms are still replicating. Because as we breathe out carbon dioxide, you would also see that these microorganisms produce carbon dioxide as they grow. When it comes to the key design challenges, it depends on the type of bioreactor that we have. And we roughly discriminate between two different categories. So the first is um, what type of microorganism you're working with, um, or whether you're working with enzymes, for instance. And you will see if we're working with particularly small microorganisms, these are quite sensitive to shear. So with that one, you have to be a lot more careful on how you actually distribute. Uh, imagine if they need oxygen, that you can't have your impeller on at full speed, it doesn't work. So you might need to look at different reactors designed to make sure that the oxygen is appropriately distributed in your reactor. Whereas enzymes, they are much less sensitive when it comes to shear, so you have a bit more flexibility there. And then the obviously second uh, thing is whether you're working with an aerobic culture, which needs oxygen, or whether you're working with an anaerobic culture, whether that's not such a big deal. Three key design challenges are first, your reactor design. Your reactor design actually decides on 50% of your capital expenditure. So you really need to make sure that you've got your reactor design right. The second bit relates to uh, keeping these, maintaining these optimal conditions. And there are two key things here. Uh, the main thing is the oxygen transfer rate. Now, the oxygen transfer rate, I'm going to show you a little video which details how this actually works in the reactor. And what you can see here is that oxygen, the gas, is only sparingly soluble in the liquid. So you really need to make sure that you continuously stir it because these cells use it up within seconds. And then the other kind of key thing that's important here is the heat, so the cooling. So you need to make sure that you appropriately cool your reactor and as they grow, you generate a lot of heat. So that can also cause some problems. Now, there's also like a third aspect to this, and this is sterility. So now if you have your tanks, I think we all nowadays know how important it is to actually clean surfaces. So cleaning between different batches is not an easy task. So you really need to make sure that you have the appropriate uh, conditions that you're working with. And especially when you're working with continuous, uh, and when you're, you're operating in continuous mode, this can cause some problems. Because as you go along, uh, these bacteria, they might mutate. So you can get development of resistant strains. And some of these strains might not produce the protein that you want. So sterility is a very important factor as well. So what would you have learned from this video? So you should have an idea of your typical stir tank bioreactor and how this is slightly different from your normal reactor. So you know the key components in there. And then you should also understand some of the, the key design challenges that we're going to talk about next.